Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream event on the 8th of December 2020. Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics here. Great to have you on board. Thanks for spending some of your Tuesday evening with us. And uh, I've got Tony Lacantro from Outer Capital ready to join me in just a second. Just before I do that, just want to remind everybody as normal that this is not financial advice. Um, do please play nice in the chat room, no racial slurs, it's being moderated. Um, this is as at the 8th of December 2020. And if you want to get my attention on the chat, please use at what the world. Uh, there's always plenty of stuff going on. I don't necessarily have um, a chance to look at all the chat, but uh, certainly if you use at what the world, there's a really good chance. There is also a chat enabled, which means that one, you can get your question to the top of the list. And two, if you want to, you can make a contribution to assist us in what we're doing. And uh, every uh, dollar helps just to keep the show on the road. Anyway, without further ado, I'm going to push a couple of buttons and hopefully I can bring Tony in. So let's push that one first and I'm going to push that one first. Tony, are you there? I'm here, Martin. Uh, thanks for having me back on the show. And if anyone can push buttons, it's certainly me. <laughs> Excellent. Well, it's great to have you back on. And, um, you know, the last uh, time you were on, uh, we had... Uh, Great time and uh, great response. I'm sure we're going to do the same again. And boy, it's been a really interesting year, isn't it? If you think of where we started and where, we, where we've ended up, you know, we've got markets at very sort of high highs. We've got um, um, the housing market looking as though it's sort of going back the other way, thanks to all the government money. And yet we've also got all the government stimulus supporting the economy. And the question is, what happens when the stimulus is pulled back? So it'll be a really interesting interesting time so we do live in interesting times yeah who, who would have thought that uh, this time last year would be not only have a global pandemic we have asset prices across the board at record highs you'd be able to flog a used car at a much higher price than you'd ever get and the commute to work for a lot of us uh, is under 30 seconds so the whole world has changed with this work from home revolution I don't go into the office as much. And I think we're living under the COVID fog at the moment. And I think it's it's like in 2017 when the world went batshit crazy over houses, cryptos, lithium, tantalum. Uh, a lot of these bubbles often end with um, Imodium being the final bubble. And I think that's going to hit a lot of asset classes. And where else in the world could you have so many opportunities to take out your trash? Uh, you know, the con economy was stuffed uh, leading into the surprise Liberal election win. And then suddenly uh, people that were struggling uh, to, to pay their mortgage were blessed with a global pandemic and a mortgage repayment holiday. I just, you know, this window has been open for far too long, but at some point it's going to slam shut and the world is living in a state of delirium. Everyone's bullish. And when you get that consensus being bullish, you know it's time for the, um, the shit show to start. So the correction uh, won't be far away, Martin. And I think your viewers really have to prepare for it. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, government money flying around the system, a lot of liquidity, a lot of QE, all of those sort of things are there at the moment. But at some point, the music will have to stop to some extent. And uh, that's going to be, I think, when it um, is going to get very interesting. I'm just going to answer one question on the side here because um, uh, uh, I got a really interesting question. What sort of dogs do you have? Well, we actually have um, a couple of failed sheep dogs, um, <laughs> and uh, they're about two years old. And uh, basically, um, they are extremely disobedient. Um, I'm still trying to teach them how to do the things that they should do. Uh, I think there's a moral there. Um, the the fact of the matter is that um, uh, Tony, I've learnt uh, that you can take. Um, dogs so far but unless they actually have an intent themselves to do stuff you can't really get take them very far I think that's a good analogy for the markets yeah ab absolutely and it's it's funny how you know the exit doors are, are open a lot longer for the savvy people to to get rid of things they don't need uh, you know you had a strong run there on treadmills and personal gym equipment which a lot of people have bought and the curbside cleanups in a couple of years are going to be a lot of fun. 
So yeah, it's a weird time. Uh, you've got all this consumerism that's come back and, and a lot of retailers are still going to the wall. So yes, yeah, certainly uh, interesting times, Martin. And um, yeah, I have put together a bit of a slide show, uh, which I'm happy to start if, if that's okay. Yes, absolutely. Just let me uh, pass on a few regards. So Vanessa, yeah, sure. um, Charlie, um, are both saying um, good day to you, Tony. And um, I'm sure there will be more too. Um, you may have seen I've changed the way that I'm presenting the uh, the chats on screen. I think this is a little bit more sophisticated. So um, uh, as they come up, I will uh, I will uh, throw them up to you. But anyway. Um, Go, go for your life, Tony. Uh, you're going to share the screen. Um, so um, we're in your hands. Yeah, I, um, I believe I'm better technically now. I've had a few lessons in screen sharing, uh, but please, I am old school when it comes to all this stuff. So I hope the audience can forgive me. But anyway, let's see how we go. Yep, it's all working. Oh, it's all working. Yeah, so uh, I've done a, um, a cover slide for everyone. And I think probably the most important point is the disclaimer. So this is all general advice. I'm not telling anyone to do anything. It's all my opinion. It's not actually the opinion of Auto Capital. So all my ideas are my own. I should disclose that I have significant holdings in most of the small cap stocks I'm going to mention. And what I've done for viewers is I know that a lot of your audience are skewed towards the property side. So I'm actually going to run a lot of my property and economic discussion first before I run through the stocks. So yeah, I've, I've, I've listened to viewers and uh, I'll accommodate. So on the 23rd of December last year, this became my pin tweet. And I didn't foreca forecast a global pandemic, nor the volatility on global markets. I forecast the stock market to be um, lower. Uh, apparently, November was probably the best month on record for the ASX. I said Sydney house prices down 12, Melbourne down 10. That looked fairly likely. I got the AFL right. Richmond, um, Western Bulldogs didn't really fire a shot. I went for the Roosters, got that wrong. And same with Parramatta, they, they disappointed. But one area where I did get it right I stuck with um, gold, silver and copper, regenerative medicine, chronic kidney disease, fibrosis and repurposed drugs. So I think I've got those sectors quite right. I did have the top 11 stocks for 2020, which became top the top 12. And there were some shows where I went through these stocks, Martin, and was happy to provide viewers as to the reasoning why I liked them. Then suddenly the photos on the right are showing the COVID fog over the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And viewers might be able to recognise the COVID fog there over Melbourne. So that, that, that fog has pretty much clouded my predictions and it's made this year forecasting a very tough year. But, but I am gonna say that as sad as it sounds that COVID, uh, the work from home, people starting trading actually really helped my, my share market performance and my clients performance. So I've actually had one of the best years of my career uh, in a global pandemic. And a lot, a lot of that time, I haven't had to get out of my, my underwear. Um, you know, the trip <laughs> That's quite the a office. thought. <laughs> well, can you, no, don't, don't quite imagine Homer <laughs> Simpson in wide fronts, but where else can you walk 10 seconds out of bed to your office and toss millions of dollars worth of shares. It's, it, it's insane. But I admit life, life early was tough for us. Um, but in Perth, it, things have been pretty normal. I actually, I had one of my major wins a few days ago. I was scouting Gumtree for decent human nature tickets. Uh, they're playing at Kings Park and I actually managed to find someone selling them. And that's probably my greatest win this year. And it's just been great in Perth to be able to go to these concerts, to have quite a normal life. And, uh, you know, I feel sorry for the people in the Eastern States that have had to, had to live through these dreaded lockdowns and the draconian measures. But no, I mean, life's been normal, actually. It's probably been a bit easier. But yeah, those, that COVID fog has certainly uh, made things difficult. Um, 
one of the beauties uh, things about being on this program, Martin, is I can say and put up what I want. So anyway, I will. <laughs> so um, that's that was the last time that prof- property was affordable in Australia. So there's a picture of me. Oh, that was actually in Belmore Park in Sydney. Uh, hundreds of pigeons died, and I was the police officer being interviewed. And I was about 24 then. Uh, obviously, you can see I've been gently basted with the ugly stick. But yeah, that was the last time that property rel- relative to wages in Australia was affordable. And on the right, we have um, Kurt Cobain, which I reference a lot of the events in my life. And interestingly, the, the guy that owns Rode Microphones, which we both have, Martin, he actually purchased that guitar. And I think he paid about $9 million for it. So my point there is that house prices relative to wages in Australia haven't been affordable. And roughly when that photo was taken, uh, I, I was able to buy a unit in Bondi, walk to the beach, walk to the police station. And this is when Bondi was uncrowded and you didn't have a chemist warehouse or that um, black town by the sea fields. So I don't know. I don't know what's really changed in Australia. You know, we've gone from uncrowded waves, nice place, affordable real estate to these bustling tourist meccas. And uh, yeah, so anyway, so that was the last time housing was affordable. So I think that chart is beyond frightening. Um, It shows constant quality real house prices. So that actually allows for renovations, much bigger houses. So as you can see, I think viewers have to realise that, you know, property can remain stagnant for about 50 years, which it did. And we had that uptick just after World War II. And there's no, no reason why it shouldn't because a lot of men came home and families could start to prepare. But since then, Martin, that, that chart has gone absolutely insane. And though that industry is, is frightening, and I think despite what the cheerleaders are saying, um, that has to correct, and, and it certainly will. And one of the, the sad things about when markets overshoot to the upside or go insane is that they tend to revert to the norm and then overshoot to the downside. So I'm, I'm going to try and keep things a little bit topical. So this, a, a few of the things that have happened this year, and I think that something to w- worth noting is I was having a look at Marsden Park and, you know, you see a lot of houses like on 160 to 300 square metres trading, you know, seven, eights and nines, but the residents in Marsden Park are trapped. They can't get out of the place. They're building a bit more infrastructure, but these people have bought what they think are their dream homes and they can't get out of the place, they can't get in. They're just struggling with it. And I think that with those ridiculous prices is something has to give. And what what we saw then was um, Jordan Springs and the whole suburb apparently sinking where Len Lease have had to buy back houses and a lot of speculators in property obviously have sold estates um, at East Dubbo, which is around that area. And people have thought, well, hey, I need to build my dream house. Everyone else is doing it. I need to get on the property ladder. And suddenly their houses are sinking. And I think, honestly, probably the best thing to happen to some of those people would be a payout, to be honest. Um, I don't see how many of them could afford to to keep their um, payments going. But another interesting point has been the rental crisis in Perth where vacancy rates are under a percent. And I've seen that around this area. It's, it's just very hard to get anywhere to live in Perth. And I think that's starting to put a bit of upward pressure on, on house prices. And I know that some of the, the forecasts for Perth are in the vicinity of um, 12% for next year. So I'm just going to go away from those slides for a sec. And, um, yeah, go, go from there. Yeah, okay. Now, very interesting. And um, there's a few a few interesting comments that people are um, uh, making. Um, one of the most interesting is, um, uh, I think, this one from Damien, who basically um, 
Ted, are you seeing, seeing a commodities and resource boom or is this similar to the end of 08 when those sectors fizzled out? And of course, you know, you often say, I think I often say, well, history may not repeat, but it often does rhyme. Oh, a- a- absolutely. And I think uh, you're, you're seeing a combination of supply constraints and a, you're also seeing quite a lot of speculation in the commodity sector. And you've seen copper just hit a seven and a half year high. You've seen greater calls for nickel in EVs, which nickel makes up a greater portion of it. The iron ore price is out of control. Uh, Gold's volatile, so the gold price tends to react to uh, vaccine news out of Pfizer or or Moderna. Look, I don't think it's a new dawn in commodities at all. I can understand some of the less loved commodities such as zinc and lead being stable with a bit of upside because there hasn't been much in the way of exploration and and new developments. So I think, again, commodities are part of that COVID fog and a lot of people, I think, should take out their trash, the commodities or stocks. There's been some ridiculous talk of these emerging bubbles. But what I've noted is that uh, the money has to go somewhere and a lot of these sectors are, are becoming overheated. Yeah, what, I think- I have, what I have noticed on the ASX is the amount of mining announcements every morning. And there is just heat. I haven't seen that many for years. And I haven't seen all these dodgy projects being picked up by companies in exotic places, mainly Africa. These haven't got a hope in hell of being mined. The only thing mined are shareholders' pockets. So, look, be very careful with commodities. Right. Well, there's a very interesting couple of questions. There. Firstly, a comment from Think Help, which I thought was quite good. The steam coming off the money printers is going nuts, right? So that's where all the fog is coming from. I thought that was quite funny. Uh, but then actually uh, uh, Greta asked, um, what do you think the signal will be of the asset bubble bursting? So in other words, what's the leading indicator? And that's an interesting question in its own right, I think. Oh, that's a fantastic question. I'm going to say... Um, the peak of the asset bubble is going to be uh, at the peak of stupidity when you, you start seeing these ridiculous forecasts for 20% growth in houses. You see commodities to the moon, stronger for longer. Then you start seeing the interest rate talk lower for longer. Uh, you've got multiple assets. And I think asset classes will not fall over when everyone's bearish. But the world has just gone absolutely crazy with this uh, it's got to be happy gas, and then you'll start to see some cracks emerge. But what what you've seen with some assets like property, it's the, pretty much the sector was in trading halt. So how can you call that an efficient market? And in the case of the ASX, we almost missed a full day's trading due to a software glitch for derivatives. So really, everything's starting to get out of control, and it's not going to take much. I, I see this, I liken it, I've used this before, but it's a very fragile piece. It's like this new couple, they're out dating and they choose an Indian meal and it's each of them struggling to hold in their bodily functions. And that's how fragile a lot of these asset classes are. Oh, Tony, uh, that that picture. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Vanessa said it's the government fairy godmother, right? And that that's partly right, isn't it? Because essentially, all this liquidity being thrown in, all of this money printing, all of the um, you know the job keeper, job seeker, the superannuation withdrawals. I mean, that's completely artificial. And 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 in a way, we do not have functioning uh, markets. We have markets that are really being supported by government. And therefore, they're not really, you know, standard markets at all. No, I, I just liken it to uh, I, me transferring 50 grand each to my kids, something like that. They're never going to learn. They're never going to learn uh, discipline. It's like giving them everything and they end up, end up with a drug habit and go through multiple marriages. I just don't think there's any financial discipline in the system at the moment. All these people taking out their super, a lot of that went into poker machines and at the TAB. So not only are we the worst gamblers, but we've gambled away our super. But, you know, the government doesn't realise is that once once people start to sell houses, all bets are off. 
and there's two there's two ugly words in every asset class and that is price and discovery so what happens when some of these hundreds of thousands of mortgages uh someone's forced to sell in in a suburb then a, a few other people selling that street my argument is that the real estate agent has to eat has to get a sale and suddenly you have 10 15 20 percent correction and that's how fragile uh the australian economy is yeah absolutely now here's an interesting question from uh, master singleton what's your take on the overvalued zombie companies keeping the ASX afloat? There are quite a few, aren't they? Yeah, the ASX is actually um, clamped down on these cash box shell companies that don't do anything. And a lot of them, once their suspension period is up, they'll actually get delisted. But, but what I've found is in any bubble, uh, if we go back to uranium, there was like three or four genuine uranium companies, then suddenly there's 180. Same with lithium, cobalt, uh, dot com. So bull markets tend to attract the band bandwagon jumpers. And once once a, a sector implodes, a lot of these companies will just pay wages, keep their listing, and vend in whatever project comes along next or sector that's hot. So I, th I think with the proliferation of speculative companies out there, I think the ASX has certainly got quite a tough job to curb in uh, and a lot of these companies don't pass the quality test but who's, who's going to place it when there's lots of problems at, at the regulators to start with well it's a good point and of course in the US which is um, even more uh, um, crazy we've had huge amounts of uh, company buybacks uh, you know they're buying back their own shares by issuing very cheap bonds um, and, and of course that is actually at the expense of investment in business development so effectively they may be seeing their share price go through the roof but there is no real investment in the futures of the businesses and you know i've talked to somebody the other day who thinks that about one third of u.s companies now are effectively zombie companies it's also similar in europe as well so we, around the world we've got lots of uh, companies that probably in a real if you had a normal market you know if, you, if, if capitalism was really working they would have folded but no 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 they're still there they're still dragging um, uh, equity uh, away from other companies and it's another example of this sort of you know weird environment we've got um, it's not really um, you know proper capitalism at all it's not going to the point where equity is going to the you know the, the where it can create the most value it's just basically going to wherever people can actually fiddle their books and make their uh, share price go higher and that ultimately is i think quite destructive oh more, very much so and there's a lot of companies on the asx that are bigger dogs than the one behind me i'm actually going to um i'm not going to ask him to move uh we just had him desexed and they believe they've found cancer so um yeah it's it's not good but it's part of the dog's life he's he's getting on now so he can quite happily sit behind me and do whatever he likes no absolutely i mean my view is yeah. that uh dogs are good uh, more dogs are better um as i mentioned my uh, the, the ones we've got here earlier on so uh no that's absolutely absolutely fine the dogs were dogs are dogs <laughs> what am i might do Martin? i might see where i'm at up with the slides and yeah go yeah go for the yeah. next chunk yeah be good yeah, all right. Okay, um, here's an interesting point. I, I've been watching a lot of press on the Perth medium price. And they're actually forecasting a bit of a return to the boom days. But the other, other thing, Martin, is below that, that's the medium price or orange. So, you know, I've read in the weekend Australian magazines about the resurgence in places like Orange and people moving out of cities to these regional centres. But again, what, what is really going to happen to those places once people get bored of being out there, get bored of the tree change? And, and what those what that slide illustrates is you, you'd have to now believe that Perth is the best value regional part of Australia now, Martin. Yep, I think that's right. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are talking it up. Um, actually, if you look carefully, you have to look very carefully at different areas around Perth because not all of Perth is and the surrounding areas behaving the same way. 
Yeah, and I just I just find it interesting that all these uh, little towns with a cafe culture, an art gallery. I think the likes of Broken Hill have more art galleries than pubs. <laughs> uh, they're great, and I think what it's going to do is force prices up. It's a bit like a short-term sugar hit, and I think a lot of these markets are going to end up in what happened in Hobart, where it's like a uh, a cray or lobster pot. It's easy to get in, but um, try getting out. But yeah, just an interesting observation that regional centres, their their median prices are in some cases higher than um, than Perth, and we're we're a completely normal functioning city, believe it or not. And sure enough, we don't have a beautiful harbour, but um, oh god, life's good over here. <laughs> anyway, I, this is one area. I mean, one in five deferrals are in strife. I mean, how long can people hang on? To be honest. Uh, massive mortgage portfolios, and if people can't pay, where where are the jobs going to come from? Where is the cash going to come from? I mean, you know, I think now anyone with a hint of financial strife um, should be going, putting their car on um, Gumtree or car sales, or worst case, just taking it to a dealer and flogging it when, when the prices are good. But that, that is a lot of borrowers in a lot of trouble. And I just don't see how anyone in the mainstream media or these forecasters can suggest that prices are, are going to increase to those levels in, in the major cities. Now, that's a huge worry. And as I said, financial strife, if your neighbour is in financial strife you, and, you're, and you're a bit precarious, you should hope in hell that suddenly some for sale signs aren't going to appear but that was taken in in uh july so um probably a little bit worse down the track now so i like these two um basically yeah the recession is technically over but for wages and jobs the recovery yeah it's going to be a long recovery well i don't know what an economy is i thought um wages and jobs kind of drove the economy you know can i can understand the snapback. back <laughs> I understand the snapback in the GDP because we act absolutely got polaxed. But let's be honest, uh, if you're desperate to hand out food vouchers to the population to go out and spend money, um, you can't stimulate it. If people people start to become, they start to save money when, when there's economic conditions are going to get worse, you've got to look at the Japanese that are prolific savers and now the elderly in Japan are forced to commit petty crimes because they'd rather live in prison. I mean, it's just absolutely ridiculous. And, you know, let's use the term, technically we're at a recession, but to me that's just a catchphrase. And the used car bubble, which I've mentioned, a um, couple of weeks ago, um, I have three kids and they all hate me, I think. But what I did two weeks ago, uh, two of them, I think, said they hate me. I just said to my partner, look, let's go and sell two cars right now. So I went to the dealer. The dealer, they can't get stock. So I got pretty much the price I wanted. But people don't realise is that these car dealers aren't going to make money off the sale price of the car. They're going to use that car as an instrument to develop a financial product, maybe sell them paint protection, mats, and these extended warranties that people don't need. And I think car dealers have been crying out for that. But to me now, I've, I'm going really minimalist with my lifestyle. And we have one decent car and uh, something that I drive, which, you know, people would call a shitbox. But for me, there's no real cars don't spark joy anymore. And I've just woken up. Um, it's funny how your love affair with cars start. I mean, I was at the uh, police academy in Goulburn. And the police credit union representative came down and they were throwing money at us. And of course, everyone buys new cars. But um, for me, honestly, what sparks joy is getting human nature tickets or putting ribeye in the shopping trolley once a fortnight and not having to worry about how I pay for it. But to me, look, this is the ultimate chance to really sell cars because if you, you think about the true costs of owning a car, and the true costs of owning a house. I mean, I haven't had to use Uber yet. And what if I do five times a year? I mean, who cares? But, you know, as you've said often, and on this program, Martin, if you're gonna panic, um, panic early, because suddenly, uh, once the cracks start to appear, 
you know, there'll be a heap of Porsche Macans, Audi Q5s, Q3s, Q7s, X4s, X5s onto the market, and suddenly uh, there won't be an opportunity to sell. So, so what I did, um, I put this document together a while ago. Uh, obviously, it shows the general rule for a housing bubble in Sydney. And I think a lot of, lot of what is in that document has long been forgotten. And the fact that uh, Morgan Kelly, who does all that wonderful research on house bubbles, he was in that, that uh, dispute with Jim Powell, which every, every home buyer should watch. And he was suggesting that 70% 70, 70 of a bubble, you actually lose. So, and I came up with the reasoning why the median house price should get back to 640,000, which historically is still gonna be expensive. And I know that probably seems a long way off, but I can assure people once this COVID fog dissipates and we realize that there's not much of an economy left, everyone's indebted up to their eyeballs. You're gonna have price discovery. You're gonna have sinking suburbs. Uh, there's gonna be more disputes over the building. And I think we're certainly gonna to head towards those levels. So yeah, I'm sticking by that. It's probably gonna take a little bit longer, but um, certainly doesn't mean I'm wrong. That, yeah, that, my point with that is um, often in, in markets, sometimes you have to actually go totally against your emotions. And, and what I do as a financial advisor, I feel as though I'm pretty much just a roadblock uh, to people wiping themselves out financially. And what I've had over my career has been people that, you know, you ring up and say, look, you've made 10 times your money on this stock. And I feel as though I'm the ATO or the child support agency, and they'll tell me to go away. A lot of these people then won't answer the phone. So I'm thinking, what the hell does someone have to do to try and help people? And I just thought that that Seinfeld clip just showed if you're prepared to go against your emotion, if you have the guts to go up, walk up to that pretty girl, because, I mean, or handsome man, because pretty girls, no one talks to them because they feel intimidated. But if you show some humour, be first guy. I mean, look, I fit some of the George's criteria, but here I am happily dating a nine to nine and a half out of ten mark. So there's a moral to that story. <laughs> well, the interesting thing, though, is that, um, you know, I, I sometimes say if everyone is zigging, try zagging, right? So uh, maybe sometimes um, following the crowd and following the herd is not necessarily always the right thing to do. Well, the, the herd, the baby boomer herd that sat on the backsides did nothing. They watched their properties go through the roof. Uh, which, which is fine. They took the risk to buy a house, often often in the 70s when it cost you four to five times your income max, and then suddenly you're rewarded with a house trading at 16 to 20 times. To me, by buying, they've, they've bought smart, they deserve to, to take the spoils. But, you know, assets are really only have sentimental value if you can afford to hang on to them. And I just think that once some of these people that are comfortable, want to start, maybe they do want a tree or a seed change. I just think that combined with selling pressure from elsewhere, uh, that's when you're going to have uh, your markets fall away. Absolutely, yeah. And, um, you know, what's interesting, again, is that um, uh, you can find quite often that there are some people who get it, but a lot of people who don't. And uh, sometimes the people who get it actually feel as though they're the ones who are, you know, off key and out of it and actually they're sort of questioning their very motivation i get quite a few people who say well you know surely 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 if if prices are going to go sideways or up i should pile in right and regardless and what i often say is well you know do what you think's right um but just bear in mind that there could be a counterfactual view that's worth thinking about what if right what if it probably is overvalued by 40 percent what if all the stimulus that's been thrown into the system is is government driven and that's going to be turned off at some point what if china continues to tighten the trade i mean there's a bunch of things that you can start putting on the table but what i find quite often is tony a lot of people just sort of put their fingers in the ear at the first point and say la 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 la, la. no it'll be fine and just carry on so uh, my observation is you can take a horse to water but you can't make them drink necessarily 
yeah, no, certainly, um, certainly interesting situation there. And I guess it has been the, the dream run. But um, what, what I try and do, uh, Martin, I mean, in life, I think you have to be positive about something. So despite what's been happening in the uh, global economy, I've been uh, sticking to what I know, sticking to my uh, small cap stocks. Uh, it's like I stick to these slideshows. I'm very old school, but, you know, I stick to what I do. It's like, it's a bit like, um, has ACDC ever written a ballad? And you might go and see Daryl Braithwaite at a racing function. And if, have you ever seen him not sing the horses? I mean, um, you know, I, I love the fact that, yeah, I was a police officer. I didn't look too bad. So I, I might as well run with that for as long as I can. But um, anyway, I was just going to get a little bit into the small cap area, uh, Martin. So um, Yeah, just before to... you do that, uh, there's a couple of uh, questions which uh, I'm not sure whether you want to cover now or later but people were asking about gold and what's your perspective on on gold are you going to cover that as part of the small caps or do you want to touch that on, on touch on that now i'm happy to um to talk about gold um hmm. one of the, the th interesting things about gold is i've been i was riding on gold oh way back in 2002 i actually wrote for gold eagle and i got one article with kitco but even at um, 251 dollars us we still had a vibrant gold industry. And I know I saw a talk by Jake Klein who was saying that you'll have the renaissance of the mid-cap gold companies. And what's happened is that the gold price has increased, but the company's margins, they've been able to make a lot more money um, in, in the uh, production. So that's from the gold miners, but I still see uh, gold is doing its job as a store of value. Whenever there's news of a 95% effective vaccine, it gets thumped. The only issue really, Martin, is that it's one of the world's most crowded trades at the moment. And you have a lot of people that, are, that at the first sign of uh, trouble will, will exit. So I think gold's going to remain extremely volatile. I, I do have, I've noticed from doing these shows, I have had a lot of people come to me that, do have millions of dollars uh, that are concerned about their money, I mean, in the bank. So the first thing we'll do is, you know, obviously you've got to spread it um, with the $250,000 guarantee, but a lot of them have bought physical gold and silver. But again, to me, uh, you know, I use this example, 700 ounces of gold bought you a house in about 1971. Now 700 ounces of gold will buy you a knockdown in Campsie. So I think, I think gold's done its job, but it's more of a defensive asset. You see calls for five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 an ounce. You know, that's, that's great. Keep it, keep physical gold and silver for the, to maintain your purchasing power. If it goes off the Richter, I, I'd certainly be selling it because once we have a massive economic reset, I, I think that's when gold's gonna struggle and for mine, the best thing I do as an advisor is just buy good gold companies and don't worry about the commodity price itself because a good gold company that finds, say, a million ounces is going to be worth 50 to $100 million and pretty much in any gold environment. So what will happen is if you see... Oh, sorry, I'm going around in circles a bit, but the there was a gold stock I wrote... I, raised money for called Northern Star at, at five cents. And it ended up going to about $16. But how he, Bill was able to build Northern Star from a one cent company into multiple billion dollar company, was he had to go through a gold downturn to buy up cheap assets the majors didn't want. So I think people shouldn't be afraid of lower prices because lower prices provide opportunities. So look, I'm forever a gold and silver bull, but I mainly focus on, on the companies because I'm, I'm a speculator and owning physical gold and silver would bore me to tears, like having a couple of cars out there I don't drive. <laughs> There's a very interesting question, which I was just going to put up uh, before you go on there, Tony. Uh, this is from Russ and said, if you were holding physical gold and silver, would you use it like any other tool and sell it into a strong rally? Interesting question there. I think I think you would. Uh, I think you've got to realise is that once once 
the stupid money comes in, I'd certainly feed into it because there's always going to be another asset class to put your money in. And I guess it's like, you know, a property that someone buys for $100,000, you know, in the 70s, that's suddenly worth $2.3 million. Uh, you have the opportunity to take that. And I think that's, it's the same thing for physical gold and silver, because I think a portion of that you should be trading. And if I guess if you want to be more active on the trading side, uh, the Perth Mint have some decent certificate programs. They are backed by the WA government that you can trade either by your computer or phone where the fees aren't unreasonable. So I know people that feverishly trade physical gold and silver. But again, for me, life's way too short to do that. I'd rather focus on a gold company that's going to provide 5, 10, 50 times the value by simply growing. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Tony. Well, why don't you go through your small caps now? Because I know people uh, here are hanging on that uh, section of your conversation. So go for your life. I should disclose that um, I, I pretty much stick to my niche. I I have no interest in you know crypto. I have no interest in other options. I have no interest really in a lot of other markets. I think you just got to stick to what you know. And uh, yeah, that's a good point. Someone's saying that gold's only a hedge because um, a lot of the speculative run is over. So here's our performance thus far. So I um, had to recalculate that. Uh, I had a stock called Minotaur, which actually peaked, peaked sorry, at 23 cents. And Godolphin went a bit better. So how I calculated that return was uh, the small cap market is fluid. So you're going to have some big price movements throughout the year. So I take 85% of the yearly high and I come up with a baseline figure. Uh, now, that figure, for a lot of clients, that's going to be distorted. Um, I think a lot of clients actually perform much better because uh, I did a large capital raising for Pharmos at two and a half cents. And they had some good news on the canine cancer drug and that actually peaked at 27. So again, a lot of people made 10 times their money. Some of the other stocks have been disappointing as well. But to me, that 115% return, I, I don't think I can replicate that next year at all, Martin, because uh, I'm the first to admit that I've ridden a COVID tailwind. Uh, I, yeah, I, was, I would have been happy with the 20% year, but suddenly things have changed. So um, and I, I don't think I can replicate that. So anyone that thinks I can, well, if I come back in a year's time and I have, well, it's another miracle. So so anyone entering the a new market, so that's what it's going to look like. Um, obviously, I couldn't come up for the female viewers of a decent picture. So that's Tani. He's from home and away. And I think, Martin, you should lend him one of your shirts um, because <laughs> <laughs> the guy just doesn't wear a shirt. I mean, I, can, I get it. He's buff. Yeah, he, he kind of can act. But, yeah, I, I think you could give him a shirt. And on the right, um, that's what a lot of these stocks look like now. Uh, investors have to learn who can, who can hold a conversation, who's a decent cook, and who isn't going to take 80% of your money uh, when they leave you. So what I try and do for my clients is delve through what looks attractive. There's lots of glossy magazines. You, you'll go to conferences. Every story looks great. and But you want to find a company or a person that you can take home to your mum. But anyway, that's that's I use probably those slides a little bit too much, but I'm on your show. Um, I can do it a lot. So anyway, so what I liken speculation, putting together a speculative portfolio, I liken it to putting together a rock group. Now, on the left-hand side, um, the acoustic guitarist and bass player, they can be your CFO and accountant. Uh, I've chosen Axel Rose and Mike Patton. Uh, I read that Axel Rose has one of the greatest vocal ranges in history. And I actually did Axel a favour and put up a really old photo because he's aged a bit like me or Mickey Rourke or a banana. 
Um, so there you've got your Angus Young, uh, you've got Dave Grohl on drums. So I look at speculation as you need like a rhythm section, you need something slow and steady, you need people to help you with your compliance. And um, that's, that's why I look at putting together a portfolio on the principles of putting together a rock group. Um, it's not going to be like um, Cookie Boy, who I liken to Andre Rue, and he's the, um, he's the master, I guess. Anyway, g'day Cookie Boy if you're out there. So anyway, um, look, I'm going to have a crack at coming close to that 115% return for last year. I'm just going to briefly run through some companies, Martin. Uh, the first one is Narada. Uh, now, this one is trading at 23 cents. The code is NYR. And they should be in the clinic late next year on a cholesterol inhibitor. And what they're going to do is try and make it a daily pill instead of injecting yourself. And these drugs cost between, I think they're upwards of $5,000 US. So they've had some promising trials on the cholesterols. We all know that the statin industry is massive. I know there's a lot of conspiracy theories that saying that diet, diet and exercise will curb high cholesterol, but really who, who's doing that anyway? I guess we're all couch potatoes binging on, on uh, whatever streaming service. They also have a traumatic brain injury drug, which they are developing, and that's looking quite good. So I, I should disclose that I'm on the top 20 shareholder list. I've bought all my shares on market and I'm aligned. Second company is Mako Gold. They are in Cote d'Ivoire in Africa. Now, in the gold industry, you do see quite some large takeovers of companies that can build sizable resources in Africa. Now, these are run, this company is run by Peter and Anne Ledwich. They previously found a lot of gold for a company called Orbis, which ended up getting taken over. I recently met with the company. They are looking at a major drill out. There's potentially 2 million ounces of gold on their tenements. They are well cashed up and they're trading at 11 and a half to 12 cents. So there, there is some research reports out there suggesting that that share price could triple. The third stock is Adulta, code is 1AD. They had a bit of a pop today, up to 14 cents. Uh, they are looking at uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. They're currently in the clinic and they do have an alliance with GE Healthcare. Uh, we've been buying quite a lot of stock, uh, trading around 14. I think that's got a big year ahead of it. Obviously, when when we had that COVID crunch in April and March, April, a lot of these stocks got poleaxed, and I'd say some of them were cut in half, but have since tripled. So if you if I look at those stocks that I ran with this year, a lot of them halved at one point. So if you have, I mean, if you have the balls to buy on the lows, you're obviously going to have some decent returns. The company on the end is Alter Zinc. They have a, a large zinc project in northern Italy. Obviously, Europe's been ravaged with COVID, but there, there is a shortage of high-quality zinc companies on the market and a shortage of zinc for the smelters. And they also have a, quite an attractive nickel and cobalt project. The shares are currently trading at half a cent, but it does have strong management. Uh, Garrett Harris ran Adriatic Metals, which went, he ran it to $1.20, which has since become a major resource company. So I know zinc, zinc's pretty much an unattractive commodity, but I still think that um, the management team could build a diversified company focused on Northern Italy. So a little bit interesting, um, a great company. I, I've bought shares. My next company is one called Eagle Mountain. Now th this is a copper company in Arizona. Uh, has certainly performed well, got down to about under nine cents during COVID, peak, reached a peak of about 48 cents. It's run by Charlie Bass, who formed Aquila, which was a, a billion dollar takeover. He's quite a veteran in the mining space. So what they're doing is they have a copper resource in Arizona, they're growing that resource, and they're going to, going to go out and look for the mother load. So that's another solid company I quite like. Hammer Metals 
is one of those little gold companies. Code is HMX. They're trading around 3.7 cents. They have a really good management team. They're Ziggy and Russell from Gold Road. Gold Road was a drifting five cent gold stock. They drilled into Gruyere and they, they ended up at a couple of dollars. So they have some gold in WA. They have a joint venture in Queensland. I think that's probably one of the best gold growth stories on the market. And it might take a bit of a downturn because I know that Dan Thomas, who was formerly the business development manager at Sandfire, would then start looking towards growth through acquisition and or discovery. So that's that's a bit of a growth story. Um, Exafarm are involved in exosomes. That's a new class of medicines. It could help with targeting diseases. Uh, the catchphrase is the worldly, where you die in better shape and you don't have as many illnesses. Interestingly, there is an exosome company listed now in the US called Kodiak, which is involved in exosomes, and that's on a bit of a tear at the moment. Uh, Exafarm has really good management. Um, Ian Dixon is running it. They now have 41 staff. And the clue is that a lot of some of those staff are actually ex-CSL people. And I'm sure people can remember that that was a $2.25 company that I think has probably gone to about $1,000 equivalent. So um, another one, which is a bit of a punt, it's called Godolphin Resources, has nothing to do with the Godolphin Racing Stable. It's actually a geological fault in New South Wales. They are looking for a massive copper porphyry system at the moment. They do have a few sniffs and they will be uh, deep drilling shortly. And if, if that comes in, that, that's a stock that could replicate what I had with Staverley. Uh, Staverley for us went 15 cents uh, to $1.42 when they drilled into a 40% copper hit in Victoria. What I like about Godolphin is they do have some handy gold resources as well to underpin it. So in, in this speculative arena, I'm looking for something that's provides downside protection, but gives you plenty of upside. And to me, around 25, 25 and a half cents. Sure, it has a high amount of risk. It isn't for everyone. But for me, that's pretty much about the perfect mining speculative share. So this company does have great management. And, it, and a lot of companies, when they make a big discovery, they tend to grow in it. Uh, Metal Bank, I uh, should have results back by Christmas. They drilled a very attractive gold target in North Queensland. Has been disappointing this year. Hasn't really performed for us. But if they get some sniffs in North Queensland, um, I think the shares can have a decent run above the 1.2 cents they're trading at. Another steady player is Proteomics International, which has actually been quite a good performer for us. They have a diagnostic test kit, which indicates if a diabetic will get chronic kidney disease. So quite a very valuable product, and they're just starting to do licensing deals in the likes of Israel, and they'll certainly grow that uh, through the test kits and applying it to, to countries where diabetes is a huge issue, along with chronic kidney disease. But that, that test kit can predict it four to five years before it happens. And to me, that's a decent unmet need. And they also have, they're developing a test for endometriosis, which affects one in nine women. And as well, uh, the testing process for that is diabolical. And I think they could help out with that. And my last one is Red Metal. Another stock that's, apart from the run in silver, has had, I, I, I'd say, a disappointing year. Uh, again, they've got major drilling projects. So it's another one of those companies that could deliver the Powerball and I call it a life-changing or a life-destroying win where, you know, this thing could go through the roof. And we have had a lot of companies, exploration companies, that have gone from 12, 15 cents to over $3. So they're, they're the companies I'm heavily focused on for the end of this year and next as I said before, Martin, I don't think I can replicate the return that we've had this year. I just had too many COVID-inspired tailwinds. And I think that once life gets back to normal somewhat, whenever that will be, 
I think the the interest in trading it might slow down a bit, but but when you've got people paying, you know, five to ten dollars a trade to change their mind twenty to thirty times a day, um, you know, something's certainly wrong. I've uh, got a few questions for you. Uh, the first one's from Agent Smith, who said, "Are all those companies on the ASX?" Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, I don't I don't trade on international markets anymore. Uh, I used to trade on the Canadian exchange, but unfortunately, I missed out on something called sleep. But, but um, they're all ASX companies. I'm happy. I'm happy to provide the codes and and information uh, in the comments section, Mark. Uh, yeah, send it through. We'll put it in the comments below for those watching and replay. Uh, another question. This is from Aaron. Can you put your super in shares? A absolutely. Um, the issue is that once you go to a self-managed super fund, I I actually think it's a, quite a risky strategy because you get complacent about your assets and a lot of people in previous bubbles have blown up their super funds. So I, I think you've got a lot of people that have spent years working hard that are going to have huge payouts that then get into shares or crypto or other stupid assets and start punting it and blow up their futures. And I guess we saw that with these super withdrawals. So what, I, what I'd suggest is take, if, you, if possible, only speculate with a small part of your superannuation. I just think that to me, even though it's tax effective, uh, I don't want to see people blow, implode financially. And a lot of people that come from this program, and I, I must say, I'm, I'm about to put up the full house sign, Martin. I, I, it's got to wonder when it's enough. How many clients do I need? You know, how many yachts can I water ski behind? How many Q5s can I drive? But look, the point is only speculate with a small portion of those funds. I say to people, look, I don't want more than 5%, 10% of your total net worth to invest in small cap companies. And I guess, but now the challenge is that if you go out in a self-managed super fund and buy a lot of blue chip shares, I guess that performance is going to be replicated but to me, a lot of people don't have the knowledge or the time to manage their super by themselves. And I've always felt that markets are a collective of people really with no friggin' idea what they're doing, Mark. And that extends through to every market. And it's just the case that I actually do my research and I give people a chance because I understand the psychology of it. And um, you'd be surprised how, how long stupid money can go for. Yeah, but the answer to that question is yes, in a roundabout time. Yeah, and absolutely. And it's interesting, of course, that um, over the last few months, a lot of new money has come into the markets, right? And that's partly of all the government payments that have been made, superannuation withdrawals, all those things. Um, a lot of the um, money that's gone back into the stock markets and uh, other markets too, and including crypto, are from people who are relatively new to investing. Um, and going back to zigging when everybody is zagging, right? What's quite interesting is there are still some investment managers that I speak with who say, "Well, we we are still on the on the view that this is overinflated and things are going to come back, and so we're more cautious than you know the average punter." And, and you know, I think that's worth just reflecting on. Um, not many people do the sort of research that you do to really understand what's going on with the stocks. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I've been advising for 22 years now and i guess i've seen it all i've seen every excuse as to why people talk themselves out of money it's all it's all emotional and what i've been watching i watch the a lot of the day trading antics these pit traders and you could almost cue uh, the benny hill theme song and the other point i'd like to make is i'm watching a lot of a lot of tactics that aren't in the spirit of the game and that, that involves a lot of fake bids going on the market, a lot of bids that are instantly taken off when something gets under pressure. I mean, there's just, it's too hard for the ASX to place, but I'm seeing this both sides. And the amount of computerized trading and algorithms is absolutely frightening. And I, I say to my clients, when something is going nuts for no reason, you need to take a profit straight away. You need to re reduce your anxiety because these stocks always come back 
and it's not humans making the decision, it's algorithms. I go in and buy a small cap stock and suddenly there's five buy orders behind me and suddenly you start to see the orders flash. So, you know, the markets is a tough place and a lot of people need are going to lose money for the first four to five years, but I don't want to see them, you know, implode totally. And the only time that people come to us is often when they've blown up their portfolios. So I think the approach I take is there's a lot of small companies that become bigger ones and you just have to ride, go through the volatility, not get caught up in bubbles. But, you know, there's a lot of trading on the screens. Personally, I don't like, I don't think it's fair, but, you know, bugger all is going to be done about it. Right. No, absolutely. And, um, you know, I think your idea of saying, well, if you're going to, you know, verge towards speculative stocks, don't do it in the whole portfolio, do it for a small share and be prepared to risk it because you might lose it. Um, that shouldn't be where you put all, all, of, your, all of your money, right? Um, the other interesting question, I'll just put this one up because I think this is worth uh, discussing. This is from Cookie Boy. What's your thoughts on the bond market? Because the bond market is doing some really weird things at the moment, isn't it? It's, it certainly is. And if you have a look at the 10-year, the um, there's a threat that eventually, you know, we're going to be faced with upward pressure on rates. So, you know, we have... I mean, that, that's absolutely frightening for any mortgage holder or anyone out there with credit as, as well. So, you know, I remember, you know, that we had some major bond crashes. I think there was, a, there was one um, around the same time I was reasonably attractive and house prices were affordable, Martin. There was a lot of talk about that bond crash in the early 90s. But, again, it's, it's a market I, I steer clear of, um, due to what's going on in it but um no cookie boy is absolutely right uh you know it's it's one of these markets and i guess you know you've got such a combination of stupid money fear and greed that's running it yeah well i'm hoping to do an interview with steve almeter before the end of the year because of course he follows the bond markets uh, very very closely known as the bond king in the u.s uh, and Steve's got some particular opinions as to what's going on and why this is important. So we'll revisit that in, in, in another show, I think. Um, uh, now, here's an interesting question uh, from Phil again. Um, how do people invest in shares? I don't have a clue. Don't want to go through banks. Interesting question. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm i pretty much, I guess I'm almost full uh, in relation to taking on clients. Um, but... What I'd suggest to Phil is that you probably, a lot of uh, the share ownership in Australia is the safest in the world. So we do have this chess sponsorship system where if the broking firm or who you trade with goes under, your shares are easily transferable. So how my business model works is uh, people just buy and sell through me. I provide advice. I do all the hand-holding. You buy shares, two days later, that money comes out of your bank account. When you sell, the money goes back into your uh, bank account. So it's a very, very safe system. But I guess, you know, you really got to make that first step. Uh, a lot of people, if, if you're very small, um, I, I think what you can do, what I'm happy for people to do is I do a lot of uh, interviews on small caps, uh, proactive obviously this show, I do a live show as well with Elio D'Amato, is my advice would be go open up a, a small brokerage account where there will be ComSat, ComSat, you're going to have to go through a bank or another organisation and you, and most welcome to follow what I put out there um, because financially it's not going to be worth your while to become a client when you're going to be so far behind on the fees. So I think that's a good starting point um, for people new to it just make that first step. Maybe go back and have a look at this video and look at that slides I put up. I'm, I've bought a lot of those shares on market. I'm happy to pay the same price as everyone else. Some of them obviously I bought a bit cheaper and learn that way. So if you don't feel as though you're a big enough fish for me, take that first step, Martin. And even if you don't have a clue, well, 99.9% .9 of the population don't have a clue either, so you're not like. <laughs> very good let's just switch uh 
uh, tracks just slightly. This is from Julia. Uh, in fact, she quite insistently asked several times. So um, if property has been unaffordable since 1994, then why and how have so many purchased? Most have bought in the late 90s, early 2000s will be freehold by now. Um, absolutely ridiculous statement. Um, interesting uh, observation. I'm not sure that uh, that is totally true. Certainly my data is suggesting there were a lot of people who bought in the early 90s and 2000s who drew equity out and are still sitting on large mortgages. So it's um, a bit more complex than perhaps uh, that uh, statement might suggest. Well, that statement I made was relative. Uh, it was when house prices and wages disconnected. Mm. So to me, that, that's when, it, you know, we gradually became uh, three to four or five times a yearly income to these ridiculous levels now. And that was the great disconnect. And of course, people would have still been buying houses. But I'm just saying is that that price to income ratio will always come back. And that, that's, yeah, that was simply referring to the great disconnect. And yeah. I can understand that it might sound like a ridiculous statement, but um, yeah, everyone's different. And um, you look at people that bought in Perth that are still underwater 12, 13, 14 years later with all those true costs of owning a house that we never hear about. Yeah, absolutely. And if you look at the long term ratios, um, the housing affordability issues of course driven by interest rates rates were much higher back then relative to now and in fact one of the main reasons why we've got the large mortgages we now have is because in terms of repaying mortgages you can pay uh, smaller amounts because the rates have come down but then the size of the mortgage has gone through the roof too so if you actually look at how much people were paying then and are paying now it's actually adverse now more than it was then for most people. The other point is that the um, APRA data came out today and uh, showed for the last quarter that there was a huge spike in higher loan to value ratio lending uh, in Australia. And that's up till September, so I expect to see more. And it's interesting that in New Zealand today, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand published a paper suggesting that they should um, uh, dial back their high loan to value lending and they've put some discussion into the market but won't do anything until next March. Um, we are very much highly leveraged and we're very much seeing a lot of new people buying property with very high multiples in a context that Tony so well pointed earlier on is in the fog um, and we don't really see clearly precisely where it's going to go in terms of employment, in terms of wages, growth and those things. So for many people, I think they should be really cautious, um, you know, leveraging up the hills at the moment. Absolutely. And there's no, you know, with the ridiculous amounts of stamp duty you have to pay, it's, it's quite hard to get out of a, a regretful purchase. And I, I know I, I made a really stupid purchase of a motor vehicle um, my 17-year-old son loved that decision to buy that car. But fortunately, I had a discussion. I thought, well, wait a sec. I can get out of this with a small profit. I need to do it now. But if you've bought a million-dollar house on its way to $650,000, $600,000, you, you, the window to get out of that is um, it's not going to stay open forever. And those ridiculous costs uh, as well. So, you know, reasonable arguments, but... Amongst all this madness going on in the world, um, you know, economics and gravity always come to the fore. And I think debt levels and house prices and the cost of living throughout time is tolerance to one's pain to endure it. Why should people be paying 40% of their, their income to buy houses and the costs of living? I mean, it's ridiculous in Perth where I know of people that don't even earn $40,000 a year, that are single mothers that have been afforded loans um, to build new houses. And to me, that's another area, I believe, of you know cooking the books. And again, that's all, all going to end in tears. A lot of these people are going to be stuck in mortgage prisons, admittedly some of them by, um, by the sea. But I mean, as I said, life's, life's way too short to try and get on the property ladder and as, I, as it was evident in that chart I put up early on, Martin, that real house prices can stay stagnant for around 60 years. And I think that is possibly going to happen because 
the sentiment towards property, the sentiment towards property developing and property speculation is going to wane and it's not going to take much to break it. Mm. Well, you know, my modelling is still suggesting that there's very little growth um, ahead and there's much more risk to the downside. And obviously it goes back to, well, it depends what happens with the virus and the vaccine and, you know, the international borders. We know that the international borders will be closed until March next year at the um, at the earliest. Uh, that was announced today as well. So that's another dampening pressure on, on the uh, the economy. Now, um, Russ asked an interesting and a uh, very different question, but uh, I'll just uh, throw this one up for you, uh, uh, Tony. Your thoughts on EFTs such as BBUS as a hedge? Interesting, inter very interesting question. Uh, I actually had a client phone me up last week and he complained about the performance of that ETF that I put him in. And I said, well, I don't want that. I don't want these ETFs to perform because if they go sideways to slightly lower, you're going to see the returns on your stocks well in excess of that. So what I'm suggesting to my clients is when they have a decent win is to continue to build the BBUS and the BBOZ. So how these work is that for every percentage point that the Dow drops, they should return between 2 and 2.7% return. And for me, that just provides you with a longer term hedge against the US market where you're not going to pay huge fees and you're not going to suffer with these exotic options where the time value always runs out and you end up worthless. So I'm still suggesting to my clients to have some exposure to, to both of them because what happened in April and March, they doubled and then some, and that allowed people to then go in and buy undervalued stocks with, with the profits from that. So I think that's a worthwhile strategy to have, even though there's always the risk that Australia could, could see its own bubble, like Japan, like the Scandinavian countries. Even though the valuation's already stretched, we could see uh, silly money go on for even sillier periods. So that, the right thing to do is, have, is to have some funds in, in those ETFs. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I've always had the view that you need to be quite cautious with regard to some of these um, derivative type products because you can actually get caught on the wrong side if you're not careful. Um, and, and I've seen a number of people, um, particularly playing around with options, getting really badly burnt. So oh, all I'd say there is do your research and really be clear about what you're getting into and understand what happens. I always say ask the question, what if? What if the market does go the other way? What happens, right? Because that's important to understand as well in terms of uh, protecting yourself on the downside. Um, yeah, now, thanks. Thanks for that. Now, here's another one. Um, <laughs> a comment from, from Greg. Uh, Greg, feed the furnace and buy the votes. Once the election is over, it will be the ALP's problem or an unavoidable global catastrophe. Politicians are going to buy themselves power as long as possible. Um, interesting observation. I think, personally, I don't know what you think, Tony, I think that ScoMo is actually playing cards quite well in terms of positioning for the next election win because he's throwing lots of liquidity and he's promised that house prices aren't going to fall under his watch and he's throwing in money behind it. Um, I guess the question is, at some point, is the music going to stop and who's going to sweep up the mess at the end of it? Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. And, you know, we saw, we saw Bill Shorten lose the unlosable election. But for me, um, a lot of these, a lot of politics, it's same, same. You know, I remember in the early 70s lining up for fuel on odds or even days and my life's just gone on pretty much pretty much the same regardless who, who's been in power. Uh, obviously, capital gains and discounts will have an impact, obviously uh, tax cuts as well. But I think, you know, politics in Australia is quite conservative. You don't have anyone who's really out there who really thinks outside the norm in this country. I think uh, things will go on, whatever policies are thrown about, it's going to be the same. Uh, you know, Mark McGowan in WA had 90% popularity. 
I mean, unbelievable. He gets on. The guy's quite friendly. Uh, he's good at telling the odd joke. But suddenly, Liberal Party in WA is irrelevant. So I just think that it's been a period where, I'm going to use it again, the COVID fog has allowed those in power to certainly instill their pretty much to stay in power. And I just can't see any real upsets in the short term. But for me, uh, life's too short, really, to get hugely involved in politics. My role is to be good to friends, family, don't break the law, pay tax, and don't write too many letters to the editor. But I can, I can understand the political <laughs> frustrations emerging because, let's face it, uh, a lot of people are using COVID and the economic conditions as an excuse not to try and get their, themselves out of trouble and to stick their heads in the sand because once, once normality returns, it's going to be an absolute bloodbath with some of these asset classes. And I know that people are saying, well, wait a sec, everyone's bullish. Well, that's the time uh, when it starts to crack. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, interesting. And, um, you know, I think a lot of these um, time horizons that people think um, over probably should be extended, right? Because my view is rates will be very low for a three to five years at least probably longer than that um i understand the uh potential for interest rate pressures well, i think they're very low i think deflation more than inflation is likely what we'll see and it's worth reflecting on past, after the global financial crisis um prices for property and default rates reach their heights three to four years later so there's always a delay a lag in the system. The final point on that is the other one is look at small and medium enterprises. All of my data is still pointing to huge issues in the SME sector. And whilst uh, large firms are off JobKeeper, um, more small SMEs are going on to JobKeeper at the moment, even at this point in the cycle. Another reason why I think you need to take a perhaps a bit of a, a longer term view. Um, now, there's an interesting one here, um, which I'm just going to switch over to. Um, this is about afterpay. And I, I'm interested in your perspective on this because um, I think that uh, Dennis makes a really good point. What are your thoughts on afterpay and similar companies that seem to be taking customers away from credit cards? Certainly my data is showing that absolutely people who would have been borrowing on credit cards previously or indeed on payday loans are now actually getting afterpay and equivalent um, short-term credit well it, it is credit but it's um, you know not provided in the same way but interestingly about 20% um, according to the ASIC report recently end up paying uh, additional fees so it actually can be not free credit it can be quite expensive credit so if you pay it off and manage it uh, carefully fine but a lot of people end up with multiple accounts and it becomes effectively a big burden round, round the neck but uh, Tony have you any perspective on that? Yeah, I, I think it's certainly going to be a trap for, for young people. Uh, I just think that, you know, after paying zip pay, pretty much everywhere, I can understand that, yeah, the share price did breach $100. But you've got to remember that during the COVID crunch, it was 8 or $9, and it looked as though it was going out the back door. But I, I think now that they're saying that the... Uh, disadvantages now are outweighed by the good that these products do. And I think the, the regulatory authorities are going a bit soft on it. But for me, I, I'd certainly steer clear. I think the good thing is that Australians are starting to really get out of these credit cards, which are horrendous. I mean, uh, you, you go to Harvey Norman and buy yourself some new furniture and some electrical. And then if you don't pay it, you're, you're paying 20% plus. And I think that you know, it has been a bit of a bubble. and But funny how this start to buy now, pay later bubble has happened at the cusp of Australia going into this um, nasty recession and, you know, where retail is going under and suddenly people start to be fearful for their jobs and will start saving and not spending. And I just hate to know all the crap that people have bought and, um, you know, the funny thing is I've, I've moved from being a police officer, having bugger all money, and suddenly the more I earn and the more I generate, honestly, the less I want. So I don't know. I think some point, at some point you need to think, well, do I really need all this crap? Do I need cupboards full of stuff I'm never going to wear? 
I mean, due to COVID, I've got a wardrobe full of shirts that um, aren't going to fit me until I until I start exercising and and doing all that. But to me, this consumerism binge has just been extended with afterpay, with lockdowns, with all these Black Friday sales and all these absolute rubbish that we can buy. So uh, no, I hate it. I think it's going to get a lot of young people into trouble. And the wor- and the thing it will do is teach them poor financial habits. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's right. And it's interesting. I see quite a strong distribution uh, with people uh, who are digitally aware um, using their devices to buy stuff, and then using the um, you know the easy the easy credit facilities, and then getting into difficulty, but not immediately. So I think this is something that people need to be a bit cautious of. Um, and you know, I, I know that it's not defined as debt officially by ASIC or anybody else, but actually it is a form of debt, and people can trip over if they're not, if they're not careful. We're running up to nine thirty. I've got one more question for you from Cookie Boy, um, which I think is a really interesting yeah. way to end the conversation, Tony. Which is this. Will we see more flash crashes before the big crash on the stock markets? That's a good question. And I think uh, you'll see, you know, the entire ASX go down due to a technical glitch. I think you will see some weird stuff with derivatives. Uh, You'll see some operators with fat fingers. I think you are going to see quite a lot of volatility. And you've got to realise now that the Dow... He's up around 30,000 points. So these 1,000 nights down, 2,000 point uh, down nights are going to happen. And you're going to see some really weird stuff on the markets and with certain companies, just like some of them were, were pushed further. Um, some of them, some stocks were putting on 1,000% a day. So, yeah, that, that's a good point there um, where they made about going to debt. But, yeah, I think the market's certainly going to be volatile. But there's going to be a lot of opportunity uh, with it, and um, I just wanted to make the point, Martin, um, with with time frames. As you know, I, I took that bet with um, Stephen Kukulis. I I think I'm going to have to start to learn um, lamington and sausage sizzle recipes. Uh, I I don't think there's no way I'm going to win that bet, but I'm going to stick to my view in that it will happen. It's just going to be a little bit slower. And the great bake-off will happen. I'll be selling lamingtons till I can raise $2,500 to electronically transfer that money to Stephen. Um, I might even ask him if he's got afterpay or zip pay as well for that one. Yeah, so, well, it's certainly, I mean, we always knew that the government was going to try and support the economy and the housing sector, but the amount of support, you know, as I said on a, a post with... Um, Tarek Brooker a couple of weeks ago, 1.8 trillion is the price ticket for keeping property prices up. Trouble is, at some point, the piper's got to play the tune, uh, pay the piper. And um, the other point there is, and I keep coming back to this, remember people, if you have large mortgages, you may be able to service it, but at some point you still have to pay the, the, the principal back. And again, I go back to my counterfactual argument. Ask yourself the question, how are you going to pay back the principal if house prices are not going to rise dramatically like they did over the last 30 years? Might go up a bit, but it's a whole new ball game. So I think people need to be um, a little bit uh, cautious. Um, well, I think, Tony, we're pretty much there. Just um, a few closing comments. Uh, Damien's an excellent show. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Martin. And uh, family. Um, Aaron said, after pay should have warnings. Uh, have you accounted for job seeker and job keeper winding back? Yes, that's one of the reasons why my modelling is still right, cl- what, cl- very negative. And by the way, my mortgage stress up, went higher this last month because job keeper and job seeker is being withdrawn from a lot of those people who are actually quite badly exposed. Um, <laughs> Damien says, "Double down, Tony. Double down on your on, <laughs> on your bet." <laughs> that's that's actually quite a good point. I, I just think I should. Take, take the loss, learn how to make lamingtons, let let the um, bull say that I was wrong. I don't think we're wrong at all, Martin, and I think we're going to cop a lot of lot of flack, but none of these asset classes reflect reality. It's all artificial. As I said, it's like me giving my kids a car and a house and saying, on your way, there's just no financial discipline. Uh, Australia is no different to the rest of the world. In fact, we only represent about 2% of the total world stock market capitalisation and we're close to nothing. So um, economic reality will hit. 
just not in the time frames we're forecast due to a shock election win and a bloody global pandemic. And I just wanted to highlight this. Aaron said, who pays principal? Um, that's very interesting because there is a, a psychology there now of saying, I don't care about paying it back. I just keep ticking over, right? I'll just go on paying uh, and paying and paying and paying. And of course, the financial services sector love you for that because they can then value you over the life of your um, financial payments as effectively a series of cash flows because that's precisely what they want. So in a way, <laughs> you're playing their game. Absolutely. Uh, well, Tanya, I really appreciate uh, your um, your time tonight and your insights once again. Um, we'll make sure that those um, stock um, uh, tickers are actually in the in the comments below, so people can follow up. And um, I always enjoy speaking with you because you you call it straight. Um, you stand by your beliefs, which is which is terrific. And um, uh, you know the the fact is things change, but. Actually, there are always markets, there are always opportunities, but there are also risks. And as I often say to people, think about the counterfactual, think about the what ifs when you make those decisions. So um, I really appreciate your time tonight, Tony. Thank you very much for that. Any last thoughts before we um, disappear? Yeah, uh, don't buy, buy me um, body lotion and deodorant gift packs. I've bought 10 years supply already because, uh, yeah, I'm just a value person and that's reflected in buying deodorant and I, I guess don't go silly over christmas enjoy it i just think i'd rather have a decent seafood meal than buying lots of crap you don't need um thanks to the viewers it's been a great year i hope everyone comes back ready for some challenges next year and i really appreciate the opportunity to be on your show martin and as per the norm i'll be making a, a worthwhile do donation to keep it going Terrific. Well, thank you very much for your time, Tony. And uh, I hope you have a great um, Christmas and a great uh, 2021. We'll definitely have you back on next year if you're up for it. And um, there's always plenty of uh, things we can talk about. The markets will change and, uh, you know, everything else will be, uh, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, a new world. But will it be the same world, old world? Who knows? So I look forward to our, our next uh, uh, chat together, Tony. I'm just going to... Um, uh, sign you off now and then I'm just going to sign off on the show so um, I'm going to take you off on audio and visual so have a great Christmas and uh, thanks very much and I'm just going to cr come come back there to now say to everybody else thank you very much folks for f uh, staying with us to the end of the show tonight Good, a good set of conversations I hope you like the new chat um, tool I think it worked quite well just to say that um, uh, next week I've got um, Damien Klassen on and he and I are going to discuss the Santa rally or bust. And uh, I think that'll be a very relevant and appropriate conversation, given the fact that, uh, as we've discussed today, the markets are, um, you know, interesting. 15th of December, that will be the date for that show. That's a week's time. Um, quite close to the end of the year. Markets are at a record high. Where are they going to go next? So Damon will, I think, have some interesting things to say there. So with that, I just want to... Um, uh, thank everybody for their comments and uh, it's uh, really good to be able to quickly just skip through them here. Um, I do appreciate uh, all of your um, comments and conversations and um, uh, you know there will be shows next week. There will be a show the week after which will be with Edwin. So he'll be on Monday on our um, rant but he'll also be on Tuesday so that's the week before Christmas. And uh, I'll have more news then about uh, shows over the uh, uh, the Christmas and New Year, year, year period. So I want to say uh, thank you very much. Keep uh, safe, keep well. And uh, if you're not uh, coming back for the next couple of shows because of the Christmas break, have a wonderful Christmas and uh, um, come back and spend some time with us in the new year, if not before. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Thanking you for your time tonight. Signing off. We'll see you next time. <laughs>